Welcome back for our final session. Please take a seat if you haven't already. We are very happy to have Mimi Locke and uh, Matteo Hogg of Voice of Witness, an award-winning an award-winning nonprofit uh, that advances human rights by amplifying the voices of people impacted by injustice. We'll start with Mimi Locke, one of the founders and executive director and editor of Voice of Witness. Please give her a warm welcome. Hi, everyone. Hi. Is this mic working as well? OK, I think I'll just do this. All right, so um, how's everyone doing? Are you all uh, brains full, heady? OK, so I'm going to try and make this. I thought you'd all be tired. I know what conferences are like. You know, you just, you're absorbing so much. I thought I'd try. I used to be a classroom teacher. And whenever I thought the students were getting a bit tired, I thought, mm, you know what? I'll wear some bright clothing for some visual interest. <laughs> Big earrings, jangle, jangle. So um, if I see you all lagging, I'll just like do a little dance or something. Um, but thank you so much for having me. Thank you for True Stories Conference for bringing Voice of Witness here. Um, so what I'm going to do is we're going to have a really tight program. I want to hear from you as well. I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about what Voice of Witness is, what we do, and how we do it, and why we do it. And then I'm going to... Uh, invite Matteo Hoke to the stage and then we'll hear from you some questions from the audience and then we'll wrap up and then we'll all go out and hit the town and have a drink. Okay, so, all right, so Voice of Witness, we are a San Francisco-based nonprofit. Um, I co-founded this with the author Dave Eggers and a doctor called Dr. Lola Volin about 10 years ago. And uh, what we do is we advance human rights by amplifying the voices of people most impacted by injustice. So I'm not sure whether I can do this and click as well. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna stand behind here for the time being. So our work is rooted in the belief that in order to understand some of the most crucial issues of our time, it's imperative that we listen to people who've been directly impacted. So, um, and Oftentimes, we return to a quote by the author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, and I think many of you will be familiar with this. Um, right is green? Or? Green is, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oops. Okay. You can't tell a single story of any place, person, or people. The single story creates stereotypes. There are other stories that are just as important to tell. The problem with stereotypes is not that they're untrue, but that they're incomplete. How many of you are familiar with this quote? Okay. Um, I would really recommend watching her whole uh, talk. Uh, she did a TED talk on, on the danger of the single story a few years ago. Um, so this idea is at the heart of the Voice of Witness book series. We have, for over 10 years now, been depicting human rights issues through the edited oral histories of people most impacted by them. And in the past decade or so, we featured a huge diversity of issues and voices, including wrongfully convicted Americans, undocumented immigrants, and people living in oppressive regimes in places like Burma, Zimbabwe, Colombia, and Palestine. And each book, uh, just to continue the idea of um, expanding the single story into multiple stories, each book contains 13 to 20 narratives, um, heavily edited oral histories. Uh, each story sheds a different kind of light on the issue in, at hand. And when you have this collection of voices and stories and perspectives, when you weave them together, what emerges are common themes, what emerges are differences, which brings up different kinds of nuances and complexities, and hopefully complicates your thinking about that issue. And 
One of the most common responses to our books, whether it's a book on Sudan or Chicago public housing or uh, wrongful conviction, one of the most common responses from our readers, which range from high school students to policymakers, is, I had no idea. I had no idea this kind of thing happened. We've spoken to human rights researchers who spent, who've been going back and forth between the States and Sudan for a decade. And they read our book on, um, on Sudanese people displaced by the civil war. And they had no idea of some of the experiences that were depicted. Um, and one of the reasons why the stories bring to light so many hidden truths is because we actually have the privilege of spending uh, a great deal more time with our narrators than, than journalists do, um, frankly. So we often spend months, maybe years, with each uh, narrator going back and forth for uh, follow-up interviews. And what we've seen over the past decade is that these kinds of personal stories offer a really powerful, engaging way for people to gain a, a more nuanced and complex and empathetic understanding of the issues that these people face. And um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about our education program as well. So the Voice of Witness Education Program brings these stories and issues to uh, into, into the curricula of uh, schools and universities throughout the US. They're taught in, uh, at the university level, they're taught in courses as disparate as uh, comparative literature and restorative justice and constitutional law. So we work with students mainly because young people are our future, right? They're our next generation of voters, teachers, journalists, lawmakers. And we really believe that, I mean, I used to be a teacher myself, as I've mentioned. Uh, we really strongly believe that in order to really invest in positive long-term change, we have to invest in young people. And from, an, from a young age, really encourage empathy, inquiry, and critical thinking. And, um, and then we also teach our ethics-driven storytelling methodology to a broad range of people that include educators, attorneys, journalists, and even medical professionals as well. And a lot of this methodology is captured in our book, Say It Forward, which was released just this past December. Um, a Guide to Social Justice Storytelling. It's really a community guide, a DIY guide to, social, to oral history through a social justice lens. I'm um, just going to give you a quick glimpse of the, of the inside. So the first half of this might be of particular interest to all of you. It's really um, uh, a set of guidelines, insights that explore these essential questions and uh, ethical uh, issues, ranging from how to avoid re-traumatizing your narrators, your interview subjects, to uh, explorations of power and privilege and representation, insider and outsider dynamics. And, um, and it all sounds very heady, perhaps, but it's really accessibly written. And then the second part is a series of uh, 12 field reports of case studies. And these are chapters contributed by independent oral historians at different stages of their oral history careers. And um, all of these projects have been informed in one way or another by voice of witness methodology or our, our books. And they range from um, uh, the experiences of uh, African-American elders in Oakland, California, OG told me, uh, to former residents of Fukushima, to asylum seekers, and their experience in detention in Australia. And it really, each of these 12 case studies really highlights the, the challenges and successes and lessons learned from using oral history in these various um, projects, and some of them have become books, some of them have become museum exhibitions, some of them have become long-form journalistic pieces. So, um, so our, 
our philosophy is that no matter what the medium, and no matter what the delivery system, it's a good idea to inform the basis of your interviewing with these questions and, uh, and concerns. So um, I'm going to just wrap up this part by just touching very lightly on, on the fact that our editorial approach is completely informed by our values. Every edit editing decision that we make is, um, and our process is informed by the, these values of empathy, equity and dignity, critical thinking and inquiry, collaboration, literary merit and integrity. And very broadly speaking, this means that Above all, we prioritize the agency of our narrators. You'll notice I'm using the term narrators instead of interview subjects or interviewees. And the reason for that is because we recognize that in our case at least, many of the people, most of the people that we interview for our book series, they, have, they come from historically and currently marginalized communities. They have at various points in their lives and probably still have been stripped of their agency, stripped of their humanity. They've had their stories taken away from them. And so we want to recognize in our work their agency, that they have control over their story. Their story is theirs. That's why we call them narrators. And our role is really to facilitate a space for sharing their stories and then responsibly fact-checking them and responsibly disseminating them. So the narrator, uh, a voice of witness narrator has as much control as we can give, as we can imagine the, the uh, scenarios in which, in, in which there's a, a choice to be made. So narrator control ranges from a narrator choosing the time and place and duration of an interview. A narrator can refuse to answer questions that they don't want to. Um, a narrator can decide that they want to pull their story at the last minute if they, if they feel uncomfortable about the prospect of having their story shared. This has happened um, on a couple of occasions and most, more recently with one of Matteo's books. We can talk about that. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, they get to uh, review a final draft of the narrative before it gets published. So, um, and then finally, um, I want to say something really quickly about the literary merit. We, treat, we, we want each story to read as if it were a first-person story. Um, all these interviews are recorded, transcribed meticulously, and then they are drafted into first-person narratives, so we'll cut out the interviewer's part. And then we will cut out arms, ars, repetition, we'll condense, we'll chronologize these so it actually makes sense. It's rare that any of us will tell a story from A to Z. Uh, perfectly right. Um, but every word that's on the page has been spoken by the narrator. And so we want to really find this, like in 100 pages of transcript, it might be edited down to 20 pages as a narrative. And we really want to find the story within that, within that person's testimony. Um, and we really look for the novelistic level of detail in the descriptions of the narrator's experience. And the reason for that is that we want to create an immersive experience. As with any story, you end up rooting for the protagonist, right? And so when you're approaching one of our books, we don't want it to feel like homework. We want it to feel like sitting down and spending time with people's stories and also having the assurance that their stories have been fact-checked and they're supported by appendices and, and um, glossaries and, and so on. So um, I'm going to skip the next couple of slides because I want to get Matteo up to the stage. So I'm just going to give a quick introduction. Um, Matteo Hoke is a writer and an oral historian and a mixed-media journalist. He is the co-editor of the Voice of Witness books, Palestine Speaks, Narratives, of life, of life Under Occupation, and Six by Ten, Stories from Solitary, Solitary Confinement. His work often explores human rights and poverty and has appeared in the Best American Non-Required Reading Series, Rolling Stone Magazine, Pacific Standard, Guernica, and many, many, many others. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Matteo Hook. Why don't you read then 
then you join me in the draft. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's really exciting to be here talking to a room full of fellow journalists. Um, quick question, who's got a pen on them? Who's got a pen in their pocket? Hold them up, I wanna see them. I just think that's very cool to be in a room full of journalists because I know everybody's gonna have a pen on them. And I don't feel, I feel uh, a connection because I carry this thing everywhere. I've carried this with me since I was a teenager. Um, I'm here as an oral historian, but um, just to fill you in on my background as a journalist, and we can talk about the differences of these two. Um, I've been a journalist since I was a teenager. I started an underground newspaper in high school, which got me in a whole bunch of trouble. Uh, I have been to journalism school twice, and, um, and I've written uh, these collections of oral history narratives um, as well. Um, so I, uh, I'm gonna start by just kind of putting some context into what Mimi just introduced, which is the work of Voice of Witness by reading uh, an excerpt from Six by 10. This excerpt comes from Sherrod. Uh, Sherrod is still currently incarcerated in Michigan. And uh, that's Sherrod, that's me and Sherrod, in the facility in Michigan. Uh, he's been there since 1987, so he's been there about 32 years. Uh, and he did 11 years, one month, and 18 days in solitary confinement. And this is from his chapter in the book. Iona Maximum was the state's only level six facility. That means every cell is an isolation cell. The entire facility was long-term segregation. IMAX was supposedly a facility for the system's worst of the worst. Most dudes who got into serious trouble like murders, serious staff assaults, escape, etc., were sent to ICF, which is the acronym for Iona Correctional Facility. I used to say that ICF stood for insane criminal facility because a significant number of its population was mentally ill in some way. Some were like that when they got there and others were made that way by the prison. IMAX tortured your soul. Those IMAX doors were super oppressive. The cells were probably eight by seven, like being locked in a closet or a bathroom. IMAX had these colorful cells with tile floors a brick red desk mounted to the wall with an attached swinging stool, yellow heat registers, and a green window frame with a shuttered window that you could open by turning a knob at the bottom. The window was right above one end of the bunk, the toilet was at the other. Inside the walls were made of cinder blocks, which means they were hollow on the inside. Guys would tear off the metal stools attached to the desk and use them as sledgehammers to break through the walls to go with their enemies. The officers were major players in this as well. Many of them were like cruel children torturing fenced-in dogs. They would emotionally torture the inmates, assault them, starve them, throw away their mail, tamper with the food of prisoners they didn't like, all kinds of craziness. Dudes would wage noise warfare on each other with nonstop banging and biological warfare with urine and feces. When you entered some, of, some units, you were immediately struck by the pungent smell of human excrement. There literally were shit wars. I had a neighbor in detention who used to routinely yell, scream, and bang his metal cell footlocker lid all night. He would also smear feces all over his door and in the heat register, which was almost the same as him smearing it in my cell. Nothing smells worse than human feces. Plus, IMAX was infested with mice. In maximum security facilities, the power goes out at 12 a.m. From midnight until 6 in the morning, the lights are automatically turned off which means for six hours your cell is in almost complete darkness. You would barely notice the mice during the day, but at night, they would come alive. The sound of rodents romping through the heat registers was loud enough to wake you up. It may sound weak, but being awakened by the sounds of mice in the middle of the night is extremely traumatizing. That, along with everything else, was a form of psycho psychological terror. It either brought the aggression out of you or drove you crazy. I feel blessed to have survived it with my faculties intact. Many men didn't. The yard cages are how we got yard in the hole. For one hour, five days a week, each man is put in a separate cage. They look like kennel cages. There's seven cages in total, all of them attached to the other. At most Michigan Max joints, the yard cages are made of heavy duty steel. But at IMAX, the cages were made of plain old fencing. Because of that, dudes would tear the cages apart and have actual cage fights. Because I had come for something considered super serious, I was automatically put on suicide watch, which is Michigan Department of Corrections policy. The hostility began from the very beginning. 
Officers refused to feed me and threatened to assault me if I came out for showers. IMAX had an incel intercom system, and they would give me my food trays and then get on the intercom and say things like, how do you like that ball sweat on your tater tots? Officers were known to break into an inmate's cell at unexpected times and kick his ass. So to protect myself and be prepared for late night combat, I slept fully clothed on top of my sheets and blankets for two months straight. I once heard a guy say, if you are black and you do a substantial amount of time in prison, it's gonna have one of two effects on you. Make you hate white people or make you wanna kiss their feet. I believe that there's some truth in there somewhere. The MDOC is almost completely run and staffed by white people. The majority of the prison population is black. It begs the question, why does crime in urban black areas translate into jobs for rural or mostly white areas? There are majority white towns in the state where the main industry seems to be corrections. The cell I was placed in had such a drafty window that ice would accumulate all over the frame and surrounding walls. It was winter by the time I was moved there, so I had to sleep under two blankets with a hat and a towel over my head, plus socks, thermals, and coat. I brought the problem to the attention staff many times, but they didn't care. I don't know if I was put there by design or not, but again, as a kid, I'd slept in abandoned garages in the dead of Detroit winters so I could deal with all this. It seemed like once you were in IMAX, it was impossible to get out. There were different levels to the place, but no hope of leaving. Two positive things happened while I was there, though. Around 96, my father started trying to reach out and support me. Up until then, I barely heard from him. And the other thing was I had a spiritual epiphany. At IMAX, once you were released from detention, you could if you could afford it, they would let you listen to music in your cell. Throughout my life, music has always been a source of comfort. That's not changed in prison. Besides music and books, my major focus was analyzing my existence. I would constantly ask, how did my life come to this? I investigated my every thought, memory, and emotion. The primary question was always, why? One day I was listening to a Jimi Hendrix song, Straight Ahead, that I'd never heard before. In the song, Jimi sings, the best love to have is the love of life. This small statement hit a massive switch in my mind. I rewound the tape to that lyric three, four times, and the tears began to flow. I felt different. I was different. From that moment on, I had a feeling of rediscovering myself. I began to remember who I really was, not this hateful, bitter, violent, racist predator, but a lover of people and music and art and kindness. Um, thank you to, Sh to Shirai for sharing his story with me so I could share it with you guys. It's really important when we do these events that we um, highlight the first person experience of people who have lived these, these horrors, right? Uh, we're unable to do that here, so I feel very privileged to be able to share Sharad's story with you, and I just want to put that in the space that I appreciate him. Um, and uh, I'm going to come over here, join you. Yeah, yeah let's go. Great, thank you, Matteo, for sharing that story, that excerpt. Um, So, just going to go back here. So, Matteo, you have developed, you've pitched, developed, successfully published two Voice of Witness books with us. Can you talk a little bit about um, the issues that you wanted to explore in each of these books and, um, and maybe share an example of one narrator from each that really stayed with you? Yeah, so with each book, um, we wanted to explore kind of comprehensive, large issues. With Palestine Speaks, we wanted to look at the entirety of the geographical areas of the West Bank and Gaza and collect stories from those geographical areas. Um, we would have liked to include people from even outside those areas, from the diaspora, but in a 300-page book, we had to kind of limit our scope a little bit. So for Palestine, we um, traveled around throughout the West Bank and Gaza collecting these stories. Um, and what we found very early on in the proposal process and, and writing the proposal was that we knew we were going to be talking to people about human rights injustices in the West Bank and Gaza. But what we kind of found is just like, there's not a separation from life and human rights violations. It's, it's kind of woven into the fabric of life there. So the book very quickly became kind of an examination of the intersection of daily life and human rights violations. So that's what the book is. And so Ibtissam, she's, uh, she's the first chapter in the book. And um, 
you know, her story just highlights her going through these checkpoints um, as a disabled female and kind of the dehumanization that she faces just trying to go to work. You know, that's something that sticks out as an example of that intersection of human rights violations and daily life. And with 6x10, again, we want a, a comprehensive coverage of the entire United States. Um, so solitary confinement is happening in all 50 states in the United States. It's happening in all different kinds of facilities, from juvenile detention to city and county jails, federal prisons, state prisons, immigration detention. So we knew we wanted to collect stories from all these different types of facilities so we could examine and explore the, the similarities between what's happening in solitary confinement. Um, throughout the country. And, and your co-editor, Taylor Pendergrass, yeah. his, his background, can you share a little bit about that? Yes, I can. Taylor is um, kind of, he's senior staff at the ACLU, and the ACLU is the largest uh, civil rights organization in the United States. They have offices in all 50 states, and um, they fight the court battles for a lot of the um, primary civil rights and social justice issues in the U.S. So Taylor being senior staff there, we knew we had a very wide network of attorneys that we could lean on for stories and maybe access to people who are incarcerated or who had survived solitary confinement in the U.S. Okay. Right. Um, and I'm going to assume because you picked Sherrod's story to share that he left a strong impression on you. Yeah, Sherrod, you know, I'll, I'll say for Sherrod, you know, he and I these are oral histories, and this is a whole other topic that we can get into. But, you know, Sherrod and I wrote to each other. So we did our oral history through email, because he had a tablet at his facility that he could use, and we could pay to send emails to each other. It was five cents an email, and five cents additional for every, uh, no, five cents a page of an email, and five cents additional for any, like, a, pictures you wanted to send or attachments. And then those, of course, are all go through this like mechanism of bureaucracy and, and oversight. So a lot of those things I would send him would never get to him, things like that, things he asked for. Um, but Sherrod and I wrote to each other for um, about two years. Uh, and we couldn't do phone conversations in prison. There was another inmate I wrote, sorry, another person in prison I wrote to by hand um, in California because you can't really have su substantive conversations with people in prison on the phone. It's loud. It's competitive for time, and it's not conducive to intimate conversation. And um, can you speak a little bit about your process in identifying what issues you wanted to explore and the kinds of narrators that you had in mind or, yeah, at the beginning of these projects? Mm. In the beginning, I don't think I, you know, for the Palestine book, I was coming in very, very green. And I'm not sure I knew the issue well enough to know what to look for. And so I probably suffered from the same stereotypes that, that everyone else in America does when it comes to, to uh, the West Bank and Gaza. So it wasn't until I got over there and started spending mass amounts of time over there with my co-editor, Kate Malik, who uh, was living there at the time. Um, you know, once we started to spend time there, the, the issues that we wanted to cover really started to kind of uh, become more clear to us. And it really took that time, which is what you were saying earlier about the voice of witness method that is very valuable to, um, to journalism and to oral history is being able to spend the time you need to understand the issue and then find the people who can speak to those issues in a substantive way. Um, because not everyone we interviewed, you know, we interviewed almost 100 people for Palestine Speaks. Mm -hmm. and. You know, not all those people are the kind of people that you can build uh, like a really high quality book chapter around their story. They might have a great story, but they might not be um, able to tell it in the way we need them to um, over the months and years. Maybe they're moving around a lot. Maybe we can't find them. Um, or maybe they're just like kind of one word answer people when it comes to telling their story or they can't really go into some of the harder parts of their story, uh, which is totally understandable. So it took us a long time to find the right people. Um, but with the issues we wanted to cover, you know, we knew we wanted people from um, a broad geographical range, but also a broad range of religions, um, different you know, Christian villages, Muslim villages, cities, um, more rural towns, Palestine separated into areas A, B, and C. So we wanted um, people that could speak to their lived experience in those different areas as well. Okay, right, thank you. Um, 
Can you, I just want to make sure, can you hear us okay? Yeah, all right, a little bit. Um, could we have a little bit more volume on Mateo's mic? Or if you could just lean in a little yeah, bit more. Yeah, I can lean in. Yeah. Oh my, okay, that's great, loud. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. That's better? better? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Better. You guys got to tell me these things. I'm, yeah. I'm up here. I always want to check. Um, and um, so you talked about uh, some of the challenges of developing relationships with narrators over time. And um, can you talk about that process of, um, of developing trust with narrators and how important that is for getting mm. the kind of stories, the richness of stories. Yeah, I mean, trust is everything, right? For journalists, for oral historians, it's without trust, you don't have any substance coming from the people that you're talking to. So for me, I just found that trust comes with time and energy. And so taking the time, spending the time to really sit and be with people is meaningful to them. It's meaningful to myself as, as the interviewer because um, there's just real investment and people can feel that, they can sense that. So there were times where, you know, people might, in Palestine, for example, people didn't know us. We were a couple, of, we were in our, uh, let's see, we were young at the time, this was 10 years ago. So, um, you know, a couple of young journalists coming in, people didn't know us, what we were about. We didn't have a large body of work to show them to be like, hey, this is what we've done before. We had a little bit of that, but not much. So we're coming in very green, and um, in Palestine, you know, people are inherently distrustful, especially if gringos coming in. They don't know us, and they don't know um, who we might be working for. And that's a fair assumption. So taking the time to really spend time in people's homes, sometimes you just sit on the couch for a day and don't do an interview, but you just kind of hang out and become part of the furniture, become part of the family. Suddenly you're drinking tea, you're eating food, and that kind of opens some doors. Um, and you do that enough with people and the story can kind of slowly develop. And so in some of these areas where, you know, journalists like us would never normally go, that we did have access to, luckily through Kate's work, um, it took real, real time to build that trust. Yeah. Um, I just want to ask you a question out of order. Um, this is not a spontaneous conversation. We did prep a little bit. Um, but because you talked about how... Um, you were green when you went in and to the Palestine Project and, and some of these issues just emerged naturally and just also through speaking with people who helped you identify some of the issues and stories. Um, how was the experience working on... So you were a journalist before you worked on Voice of Witness books. You were a journalist in between these two books um, and uh, you're still, by all intents and of a journalist. How would you compare your experience uh, working on voice of witness projects to your conventional journalism work? Well, oh, one thing I didn't tell you guys is I was a video producer for Al Jazeera as well for, for a, a time. And um, so that's where the mixed media journalism comes in, um, make, making videos. Um, I feel like a rapper when I hold the microphone this close. So. <laughs> but I'm going to do it for you guys. Um, so with, um, with my more like quote unquote traditional journalism, it was always leading towards longer projects anyway. So these projects just felt like where my heart and soul belonged anyway, was talking to people for a really long time, doing really long form work with them and really, really getting to know them. You know, the thing I love about this model versus maybe a, a quicker journalistic model is that as journalists, a lot of times we're forced to go into a situation, put a microphone in someone's face, take their story from them and leave. And we don't always leave them better than we found them, right? And so with this model, it, this more collaborative model, I found that it really informed my journalism to want to do that more because that extractive model of journalism, of taking people's stories and leaving, um, just has not been beneficial to me as a journalist. So this has been much more beneficial, this collaborative model. Just out of interest, how, um, by show of hands, how many of you write uh, long form pieces? Okay. 
Uh, how many of you operate mostly in the short form, quick turnaround space? How many of you do both? Okay. Um, I'd be really interested to hear from you about how the two compare. One of the reasons why Voice of Witness exists is to provide a platform, an opportunity for journalists, uh, traditional journalists, to actually delve more deeply and have more time and resources, financial resources, and also um, the resources of our staff as well, to engage, to basically develop projects that are close to their heart but might not find a home in traditional um, media. Well, and uh, and with so, the prison book, I'll just speak to that real quick. The prison yeah. book, you know, Taylor as an advocate, right, one of the leading advocates in the country for prison reform and solitary confinement reform, you know, he saw a gap in the, in the stories that were being told from solitary confinement. As a litigator, you know, as an attorney, he often would interview people, but he would take, you know, one paragraph that he could fit into, like, um, the one page he had to draft for a judge to, to bring a lawsuit, right, or to, to try and get a, uh, a judgment on, on a case. And so it, you weren't getting to know the people in solitary. You didn't know what took them there. You didn't know what their childhoods were like. You didn't know what they were living through after solitary. And so there was a real gap in coverage there. And, and same with, you know, so quote unquote traditional media, you know, there's just not a lot of room for those kind of expansive 6,000 word birth to present day stories. Mm -hmm. And so this creating that space and working in that space has been um, very beneficial. Mm. And you mentioned in our earlier conversation that when you were working at Al Jazeera, that there was, um, there was, a, there was a woman that you interviewed. Um, can you speak about, a little bit about that? Yeah, I took that slide out of here, but um, there, I met a woman who had just been declassified from the CIA. Uh, she had been under, she'd been an undercover uh, officer at the CIA. She had just been declassified so she could actually say, hey, I was an undercover officer at the CIA. And, um, and you know, I met her, and of course, my like journalistic spidey sense is going crazy. I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> like, she hasn't talked to anybody about this yet. Um, I would really like to talk to this person. But, you know, building that trust takes time. And so, you know, there was a lot of pressure at, I worked at um, Al Jazeera's digital channel called AJ Plus, where we make uh, short uh, videos for the web. And there's a lot of pressure to produce these videos very rapidly. Um, so to take my time and to kind of build that trust uh, with this woman uh, really made for the kind of work that, um, I could be proud of and that she would actually agree to, right? Like, because if I had just gone to her and been like, hey, I need you to speak on camera. How do you feel about that? That's not gonna fly. But taking the time to really sit down for coffee, build that trust, um, I think meant that she actually would agree to go on camera for me. Mm -hmm. And was that, in, was that your, your awareness of that need to take that time to build relationship with her, did that did that occur to you in your earlier on in your? I don't know. I think the journalism? pressure. I think it all depends on where we work. Like, um, if you're working in an outlet where there's a high pressure to to produce content at all times, you maybe you're reacting to that pressure. Um, and I felt some of that pressure uh, where I was working, but you know, just knowing that hey, this is this is ultimately going to be. For the better, mm -hmm. so do take the time, go to the coffees, don't pull out the notebook yet, don't pull out the recorder yet, just go kind of sit and listen. Things are gonna go better ultimately. Okay, well thank you. Um, there's more to say, but I want to turn it over to all of you for some questions. I hope you've been thinking of them in your head. And I think Is there here. a volunteer? Can, yeah, Is yeah if you want to raise from your the hand. foundation to help me out with one uh, microphone because I can't cover. You have an extra, oh, right? No, but there's an extra. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, go. Okay. And if you could just tell us your Thank name you. and. Um, yes. Um, hello, I'm Stephanie. I'm a freelance journalist and storyteller. 
Um, I would like to know a little bit more about the organization of Voice of Witness. How does it how does it work? For instance, do you pitch an idea, Matteo, to the to the organization, or do they come to you and ask you to cover a subject, or how does it work? Uh, it works both ways. Most of the time, we take proposals. Um, once about once a year, we make a call for proposals and. In recent years, we've been focusing our, um, our work on two areas, criminal justice in the US and migration and displacement, which are both pretty broad, um, broad tents. And um, so about once a year, about the end, towards the end of the year, we'll make a call for proposals. Um, and for, um, actually, I have a slide to help answer your questions. OK, so. Um, we invite journalists, attorneys, advocates, and so on to send in proposals um, to, uh, for, the, for something called the Story Lab. And the Story Lab is a three-month incubation period that we offer to storytellers of all stripes. And in that three-month period, we, assuming the proposal gets um, approved, we provide a small stipend, we provide oral history training, and... Uh, and also just ongoing editorial support. The, the Story Lab fellow or participant, during that three months, we want them to turn in three narrative samples. And then based on that and how well we've all worked together, we'll, um, we'll green light that for a full book development. And we'll also seek funding or we'll acquire funding before during that incubation period. So the criteria is is listed here um, and um, and really uh, occasionally we'll have um, a funder who's already doing work in one of these spaces approach us and um, or will or this opportunity will come up in, in a natural conversation um, they'll say oh we have X amount of money available for a project could you help us develop an idea for a, a book project and so we'll basically have um, have a brief uh, uh, a brief synopsis a brief kind of framework and we'll ask people journalists to uh, to respond with an interpretation of, of that brief. Brief, that's the word I was looking for. So uh, on rare occasions that, that's, that happens, but most of the time we develop books from proposal and then we find funding for those, for those folks. Yeah, I, I and my co-authors proposed both these books. Anyone else? I was, hi. Um, I was wondering because um, I feel like in the Voice of Witness books, the human aspect is so important um, compared to the theme of human rights crises. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit about why it's so important for you to tell the story from birth to present day and have the crises or the theme just be a small part of it. Well, the, the human rights issue is the anchor of the story. That's the reason why we're sitting down and speaking to this person in the first place. So, but we don't want that human rights violation to be what defines that person and they don't want that either. So we really want to treat each narrator as, um, each oral history is an opportunity to create a portrait. And, um, and that recognizes that person's full humanity and complexity, which means if you've read Viet Thanh Nguyen's um, book uh, on, oh God, I can't remember the title now, sorry, I'm slightly jet lagged, but he talks, about, he, he talks about memory and how we have to accept the humanity and inhumanity of others, whether they're perpetrators or victims. And so there are no heroes in our stories. These are complex people. There's, you know, this insiders, there are heroes, villains, and everything else in between. And so I think we really want to focus on the human because we want people to identify with, with the person's story. Um, we want them to, want the reader to understand that in some cases, you are more likely to be subjected to 
particular form of injustice because of your where you fit in demographically, but also it can be really arbitrary as well. Um, and um, yeah, so, uh, but throughout the story, we're really careful that every time that they describe an instance of discrimination or injustice, or they talk about one single uh, human rights violation that they were subjected to, that it links to a more systemic or institutional um, uh, Cause, yeah, and so uh, because otherwise it could just be oh they were just unlucky to have an abusive husband or you know um, so does that answer your question? Do you want to add to that? Yeah, if I could just add, you know, for these books I'll speak to my own too, but there it's ties to the other Voice of Witness books in this series. You know, we're complicating people's thinking, and that's that's the goal. You know, in the United States, when you talk about people who are incarcerated, right, um, we have a social problem in the United States where um, once people are locked up, society tends to just forget them and kind of assume that whatever that what happens to them in prison is what they deserve, right? And so people are seen as like criminals. And once you're seen as a criminal, like you're done. Like whatever happens to you, you're tortured for, you know, 11 years, one month and 18 days, uh, tough. You know, you committed a crime. So what these books allow you to do is get to know this person before these, these you know, human rights violations happen before the torture and before the incident that sent them to prison. So you can see kind of like, oh, I might have made those decisions too. That could totally be me. And that's really powerful for people and, and hopefully pushing that um, social shift because things like solitary confinement in the US, they're not a policy problem, they're a social problem. Uh, yeah, last question. Yes, last? please. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's better one. be a good one. Pressure's on. <laughs> uh, uh, actually, two brief questions. What is the role of Dave Eggers now in Voice of Witness? And also, Matteo, um, everybody has to pay the bills. How do you find the time? Uh, do you take leave from your paid job to do this on the side, or how does that well, work? Sorry, paid job. What is that? <laughs> No, no, I don't think there are many journalists nowadays who <laughs> yeah, know what that yeah, is, actually. Yeah. But how do you how do you work it? Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll speak to that question first. Um, I am a hustler, right? There's a hustle and the grind, and the grind is where you go to work every day, and you just you know eight to six, and you're there every day, every day, and I, that's that doesn't work for me terribly well. Um, it doesn't vibe with these kinds of projects that I want to be doing with my life, right? So then I'm a hustler and just filling in the gaps wherever I can. Um, I've been a bartender since I was a teenager, and that allows me to land on my feet in a lot of different places. Uh, I'm fortunate that, and it gives me a lot of tools as an interviewer, too. I learned at a very young age to talk to anyone, because you don't get to choose who comes and spends five hours at your bar <laughs> and wants to, like, chop it up and talk to you, right? So... Um, those things help pay the bills, a little bit of freelance here and there. Um, and I'll just say I live very cheaply and carry a lot of student loan debt. And Dave Vegas? Um, he offers some editorial input from time to time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, and I just want to... Mateo. Yes, you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to um, wrap up by saying that if... Um, uh, I like this quote by this educator called Parker, Parker Palmer um, that the human soul doesn't want to be advised or fixed or saved it simply wants to be witnessed exactly as it is um, and that if you want to find out more about Voice of Witness and our resources you can go to this website and we have some books for sale outside and I also brought um, oh and yes just uh, um, on the website there's a bunch of resources that are free and downloadable and there's everybody's email including mine so if you have an idea for a book project that you want to develop feel free to contact us we'll try and find some money for you that's my job and um, yeah thank you so much for being here and listening we <laughs>
director of Leaving Neverland, uh, one of the most spoken about documentaries of the year, and he will close the conference uh, with a special bonus lecture about the process of uh, making this film. It's from two to four in the single kerk. I would like to thank all, all the speakers, of course, who were here from the Netherlands and all over the world. And I would also like to thank the sponsors, Democracy and Media Foundation, Lira, the Picto Right Fund, the University of Amsterdam, Pakhuis de Zwijger, the Groene Amsterdammer, and the Dutch Foundation for Literature. We couldn't have done it without you. Thank you. And for the closing words, I would like to invite the director of the Narrative Journalism Foundation, Evelyn Kunst. Uh, can I take this yeah, one? Yeah. yeah, is that working? No. Ah, yes. Uh, now, I just also wanted to thank you, uh, or so, some people, and that's the audience. And uh, I also wanted to let you know that uh, the foundation exists because we uh, want to support narrative journalists here in the Netherlands. We want to give them tools, we want to give them inspiration, uh, we want to actually help them to be better narrative journalists in all forms. And that's what we're trying to do with this conference, that's what we're trying to do with Meestervertellers, that's what we're trying to do with the Gerard van Westerlo lecture every year. But we only do this if you still want us to do this and if you give us input also. So we work together with the program committee, with a uh, editorial kind of board uh, for Meestervertellers. Those are people that are very close. We have a friends program uh, but we also appreciate really your input as visitors of our events. So please let us know uh, what you thought about this conference. Give us ideas for next year, even if the idea is not do a conference at all, but do something completely different. Uh, we will send out also, I mean the conference is not over yet, but I wanted to address this to you now. Uh, we do send out a form uh, with, uh, where you have the freedom to really give us feedback and input. So I really want to uh, ask you to do that because we, yeah, we really want to sort of be in touch with you as an audience and make sure that whatever we do and organize and the guests that we bring in actually make sense. So uh, please let us know. And uh, for now, uh, I want to invite you for drinks. I, I can use a drink and I'm sure you all can use a drink after this full day. So thank you and see you tomorrow, hopefully.